take a little bit of that. If uh, you don't are not following the material for some reason, <clears throat> you don't have the right background and you'd like to read a little bit more, feel free to email me. I can send you, chat with you some textbooks that you can go for a slower uh, pace, self-paced uh, study of MCMC. Okay, and feel free to ask any other questions uh, through the lecture like yesterday, okay? So we're going to pick up where we left things, right? Last time we, uh, we motivated this idea that we should understand how fast Markov chains converge to the rest stationary measure, right? Once we know what the rest stationary measure is and that there is only one and the chain is converging to it, the main question that we'd like to answer now is how fast it gets there, right? And we need to start formalizing what means convergence and what, we, what means fast, right? Okay, so and remember that this is uh, crucial for the efficiency of the algorithms, right? Get slow, the micro chain that takes many steps to actually converge to the target distribution is going to be useless, right? Even if we think that the micro chain is, uh, is fast, but we cannot prove it, which happens quite often, then it's, it's we're in this weird space where people in practice like the micro chains, but we don't have a theory to back up that uh, uh, those uh, the, the micro chain is good. And that also happens quite often, okay? So we, in theory, are a little bit behind and we need to actually prove stuff at a faster rate, okay? Okay, so remember, uh, the question that we're going to be focusing today is, uh, How many steps of the micro chain, let's say of an ergodic micro chain, I require Uh, for the distribution of the chain to be close to the station end, right? Okay. And we're going to focus uh, mostly on one technique today, the coupling method, but I also want to introduce you to the other uh, main technique. I think these two techniques combine uh, for most of the theoretical results that we can actually prove, uh, but let, we will focus on, on a probabilistic one for the most part. Towards the end of the class, we'll look at uh, a linear algebra kind of analytical one that involves eigenvalues of the, of the micro chain, right? So now what do we mean by close? Right, this I mentioned at the end of uh, lecture yesterday. So we mean close in terms of total variation distance, right? I put this definition. All right, so if you have two distribution, let's call it mu and, and nu. Distributions over, let's say, some discrete space, omega, right? Then the total variation distance is one way, one of set way in, in ways in which we can measure distance between measures within distributions. This is just half of the L1 distance, which is just one half the summation of all the elements in, the, in, in omega, you know, x minus new x. And then there is this useful identity or analogous way of defining the, the um, total variation distance that I mentioned last time. <clears throat> that is the maximum over any set of the probability of uh, the, the difference in the probability of the set, right? Okay, and then you can check, uh, well, this, this, uh, this is immediate, you can check this identity is uh, also kind of a directly precise, okay? So this is the total variation distance. And now let's define formally, something that I define informally. Let me just uh, remove some of, of the glare here. Okay, so let's define formally something that I defined informally last time, this, uh, this notion of mixing time, right? Okay? 
And this is one of the key notions in the study of microchips. Okay, so the epsilon, it's called the epsilon mixing time. from state x in omega. So x is going to be the initial state where we start. It's given by, so we denoted by let's say t mix of uh, let's say x starting from x and you want epsilon distance. It's going to be equal to the minimum time t such that the dot variation distance goes below epsilon, right? So you look at the dot variation distance between the distribution of the chain, starting from x, right? So we're going. So remember, p t x y gives you the probability that starting from x, you hit a state y after these steps, right? So in general, p t x three here, like uh, that's what I'm using a dot. That's the distribution of the chain at time t, starting from x, minus the uh, the distribution. The stationary distribution, we look at the top variation distance between these two probability uh, measures, and we want this to be less or equal than epsilon. Right? So, the first time that we can ensure that this probability difference is uh, less than epsilon. So, this is the epsilon mixing time from state X, and the mixing time is just a uh, maximization, right? You take like kind of, you take kind of the worst state st starting state, right? So you take T mix, it's going to be the maximum over X in, in omega. And then we take T mix of X. And instead of taking a, a epsilon here, we could just put epsilon here and that would be the epsilon missing time. We just take an arbitrary constant, right? That is one quarter, okay? So this is the way we define mixing time. The first question you should ask is why one quarter? Why not your favorite constant? I think any constant here below one half would be okay. A sufficiently uh, small constant is, is okay. Because after you get uh, that the after you get the mixing time for some sufficiently small, a small constant, then you can boost it very easily, right? So suppose that in some applications you might be interested in getting much closer than one quarter, it can be easily boosted, right? Once, once you get to this, uh, to this to below some some threshold, some sufficiently small constant, then it can be boost. And if you look some textbooks, they sometimes they use one quarter, sometimes they use one or two e. So anything any any convenient concept that is easy to work with is fine. Okay. So any questions about definition? Okay. So it's, it's an interesting definition, right? And I think we talked about it last time in a sense that it, didn't, it, it is natural in theory to assume that, let's, let's, let's take the worst case, right? And it's well justified in many cases, in many micro chain, it's not clear what would be a good state to start or a bad state to start. So you need to analyze mixing time from it for, all, for, for all states, right? In some cases, it is, it is really uh, not appropriate because we know what a good start is, right? So the mixing time might be completely off. Okay, but we need some standardization to start studying this this uh, this convergence, and this is the, the standard, uh, the most standard notion. Okay. Okay. So, if there are no questions, right? Our goal is going to be to bound the mixing time. And you know it's uh, it's not an easy question, right? If you are faced with this uh, problem and you don't have to know that you don't know the techniques, it's it's a uh, it's a difficult problem, right? My questions could be quite, quite quite complex. How can you guarantee that after ten steps, how can you get a hold on this uh, on this quantity after ten steps? Okay. So luckily we have uh, thirty year, thirty or forty years of math developed on this, and now we can build on top of that. We can use some of the tools that have been developed. Okay. So the first uh, technique that we're going to discuss is the coupling method. And it's, 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 a, it's a fairly old, uh, old method. I, actually, it's uh, already in the 1930s. Uh, in very different contexts, uh, this, uh, the coupling technique was discussed. 
but it was actually David Adus who brought it to uh, back to life in the 1980s to analyze, uh, I don't know the side here, but to analyze uh, micro chain, okay? So let's see how, what is the, what is a copy? Okay, so suppose that we have some micro, okay, let's, uh, am I copy and coupling? Okay, just, let me just not uh, put more words, just a coupling of a micro chain CT is another micro chain say let's say that this micro chain is uh, over some state space uh, omega right it's another micro chain let's call it xt and yt so it's going to have this, this kind of a two dimensional micro chain over the product space right or omega times omega, right? And what we need is uh, we're going to impose some properties on this micro chain. And with words, what we want is that XT looks like if we only look at XT, it looks like a realization of the micro of the micro chain CT. And if we look at YT, it also looks like a realization of the chain uh, uh, CT. Right. So independent copies. When you look at each of these, these are like two copies running in parallel. The freedom that we will have is that we can correlate the steps of these two chains, right? So this chain can coordinate among themselves how they move, right? But if you look at each particular copy, they are a true realization of the micro chain, right? So let's let's say that formally, right? So what we want is that the probability that, okay, so that uh, xt equals uh, X prime, given that X T minus one is equal to X and Y T minus one is equal to Y. So the chain is going to be at, uh, at a pair of states. So this chain has a, is at the pair X Y. We want to make sure that the transition probability from X to X prime is the is, is evolving according to a copy of C. So you need, this is the probability that uh, X T. So, okay, so this is just the probability, the transition matrix P, right? idea of uh, going from X to X prime, right? Uh, this is right here with transition matrix. Okay. And likewise, when we look at the other copy, if we look at the probability that YT goes to Y prime, given that XT minus one is uh, X and YT minus one is Y, this is again the probability that you go from Y to Y prime. So as I said, in words, what this means that if you look at only X, so you have two copies, and if you look only X, it looks like the right uh, type of chain, right? The chain is evolving according to the steps uh, defined by P. And if you only look at Y, it again looks uh, like it's evolving like P. So those are the conditions that we put, right? So, yeah. So this is... Uh, this is the definition of a coupling. Of course, we're going to see some simple, simple examples. But before giving you the example of a, of a micro chain, couplings might be, a, I understand that this might be a new concept to, to many of you, right? So let me just give you some quick experiments here, right? So that you understand what's going on here. So how can we make two random processes look like, like they should, right? But they are very correlated, right? And let's do an example with uh, flipping coins, right? Suppose you have two coins. Okay, so you have uh, two people flipping coins, right? So one person is flipping a coin and it's recording heads and tails, heads and tails, heads and tails, such as they show, right? So we probably have one half, they get heads, we probably have one half, they get tails, right? And there is another person doing the same, right? And now as an observer, you look at the output of uh, the sequences of head and tails and both of them look right to you, right? They are both doing this, right? But now you can come and say, look, let's uh, these two guys uh, coordinate right? and let them, let them use the same coin, right? So now they're going to use the same coin to record the sequences, right? 
So one guy flips the coin and say heads, and the other one guy to say, okay, let me just copy what you did, and I'm going to put heads too, right? From the point of view of an observer, if they look at these two sequences, they both look correct, right? They both look like the evolutions of the of these processes of uh, recording head and tail, right? But they're highly correlated. In fact, they're going to be the same sequence within the two, okay? And you can correlate it in other ways. For example, you can correlate it and say, well, I'm just going to take the opposite of what your coin shows, right? And that's also a valid coupling, right? Because from the point of view of the observer, it will look like it's flipping heads and tails, probably one half and one half. Now the two sequences look different, right? But they are very, uh, but they are very highly correlated. Right? Any questions? <clears throat> and this is the, the the kind of stuff that you want to do with the micro chain. At least it's not clear why we're defining couplings, but you'll see in a minute why we're defining it. So they're going to have two different chains, and they both have some randomness to evolve. And what you want to do is they're going to use the same randomness in some way, right? For some specific to, to achieve a specific goal that we shall see what it is. Questions or coblins? Let's do one example before we move on. The simple one, very similar to the coin flipping. So that one now, now this one is for a micro chain, consider the random walk on, on the line graph, right? On a path. Okay, let's, let's assume that you have a very long path. You really don't care what happens at the endpoints, right? And let's suppose that you have two, you're doing a random walk. Actually, you're doing two random walks. One is uh, this vertex, but I didn't want to deal with the boundary. Okay, so let's say that one is at this vertex. And the other one is at this point, right? Let's define a few couplings for this uh, for these two chains, right? Of course, each of these is a micro chain. We saw that random walk is always a micro chain. So coupling one, right? They both evolve, uh, evolve independently, right? Okay, this is a very trivial one, right? Each of them. They have no coordination between them. This one will pick a, flip a coin, pick a random number between zero and one. If it is less than one half, it will go left. And if it's greater than one half, it will go right. This one will pick a different number, uh, a different random number between zero and one, and it will do the same, right? And there is really no coordination. Sometimes it will get closer. Sometimes it will move further apart and so on. That's a valid copy, right? Each realization will be a valid one. So this is a trivial one, okay? But now they can start coordinating how they move, right? They can use the same. They can use the same random number, right? And now they can both go left, right? When, when, the, when the random number is less than one half, right? And if the random number is greater than one half, then we go right, right? And now when you look at the sequence, right? Now it looks a very choreograph, right? Like they both go left, left, right, right, and the distance stays the same. But if you look at any particular copy, that's okay. They're doing the right, they're doing the same, the, the right transitions, right? Okay. So here is another way of uh, another way of coupling this. Uh, now they can they can use the same random number, but now they decide that I'm going to do the opposite, right? So so use the same random number r in zero one, and now if r is less than than one half, one goes left. Let's say orange goes left just to for, for goes left and uh, and then blue goes right, right? 
and then the opposite, right? Uh, then we flip this, right? When when R is greater than one half, then orange will go right and, and, and blue will go left, right? Again, from the point of view of the of the blue part, you go, it's doing the right transitions. We probably one half is going to one side, we probably one half is going to the other. And from the point of view of the orange part, because the same is going on. So this is another valid problem. Okay. Okay, so now the question is okay, I define this notion of couplings. Why? Right. And the reason why it's uh, because of the lemma that I'm going to stay next, right? Which is uh, usually called the coupling lemma. Okay, that is, okay, in words, I'm going to say it again. If the proof is quite simple, we'll prove it. Uh, but the idea is that, okay, so there are many ways that we can couple the, the chains, right? There, you saw there are already three, and you can be even clearer or uh, very creative in the way you create these couplings, right? But our goal is going to be to design a coupling that get these chains, these copies closer together, right? What I want to make sure is that after some number of steps, we can prove that with some probability, the two chains have reached the same state, right? In the case here of the random walk, we would like to create a coordination that will take the, the orange particle and the blue particle and, and, and get it to the same state. That's the type of coordination that we want to achieve with the code. And if we do that, if we can find a time <clears throat> at which we can prove that with some probability the two chains are in the same state, that time is going to be a bound on the mixing time. Okay, so that's why we're doing this. So that's what the coupling lemma says, right? Let's see, take a, let x t, y t, we're going to keep using the same notation, right? Be any coupling. And this is the beauty of the theorem, right? It really says for any coupling of, of the chain, right? And suppose there exists some time t such that for every x and y, so any any possible starting state. So we're, we're again going to do we're going to be pessimistic and say we're going to we'll have, we'll have to assume that x and y are worst case. We look at the probability that the two copies of the chain are not in the same state, given that we one started from x and the other one started from y. And we want this to be less than one quarter, right? Suppose that we can prove that, right? Now that, now, now that gives us something concrete to prove. And if we can prove that, then this implies that the mixing time of the micro chain is going to be bounded by the coupling. Okay? This is quite powerful, right? In a sense, it says, look, go and correlate the chains any way you like. Right, so make your life as easy as, as easy as you can make it, so that they they converge to the same to the same state. If you can manage to prove this inequality, then I can guarantee for some t, then I can guarantee you that t is going to be a bound on the mixing time. Okay, and this I think shows one. Um, okay, so the goblin lemma is quite powerful, right? If, because now it's up to you, right? Up to us. Now we have to be clever and try to design it. And there is always, by the way, there is always one coupling, right? And we'll not, I will not prove this, but there is always one coupling that will ensure that you get the mixing time. It's just that the design might be pretty, pretty it might be pretty hard to design it, right? But it's up to us to come up with clever ideas on how we find the, the coupling, right? So the coupling method is quite quite powerful, but it requires usually requires some ingenuity and some design, which is quite fun, right? You don't know, you know, the fact that one coupling that you design doesn't work, that doesn't mean that uh, the chain has is a slow. Okay. Okay. Any questions? I'm a little worried because I'm not getting any questions. So yeah, let's just, just that there were questions. So either you guys get all of this, or it's just too fast or something. So. I'm just happy to take, take a random question. Even if it's not about this, just ask a random question just to see if you are. I had a question about like, so if you scroll up for the random walk, um, do you get to choose where the red and blue ones start or is that random? And then you can only like 
um, talk about how they will behave later. Right. So if you see here the lemma, you would you cannot assume where the starting points are, right? So you need to show that for every bit of a starting state, right? So okay, they good. could be next to each other, or they could be. In this case, it should be clear that the well, it's kind of clear that the worst case would be if one is one in the, in one endpoint and the other one is in the other endpoint, because they need to get work the hardest to get closer to each other, right? But sometimes uh, it's not clear what's the worst. Uh, usually, it's not clear what are the worst okay, starting points, pair of a starting points. So you need to work for everyone. Yeah. Hey, okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, so let's prove this. It may remove some of the magic of this theorem once uh, you see the proof because this is uh, this is it's kind of simple, right? So let's uh, take any set, any subset of the state space. And now let's take a copy of the chain, right? Uh, take uh, we're going to take a copy of yt, but we're going to take this, the, the the starting state of yt. We're going to choose it. Uh, in a, in a careful way. So we're going to take that y0 to be sampled from, from the stationary mesh, right? Okay. Uh, so this means sample, right? So technically we don't know how to do this, right? This could be very hard, but mathematically we don't care about the computational aspect of it, right? We can say, okay, let's assume that y0 is sample which uh, has distribution pi, right? Pi is a stationary mesh, right? So one quick consequence of this is that once you start from the stationary measure, well, it is a stationary measure. So it's, after you take one step of the chain, it's going to uh, still be stationary, right? So this implies that yt always has distribution pi for all t greater than zero. Okay. Okay. So that's that's uh, our setup. Let's fix some some starting uh, state for. Uh, for for the other copy for x, right? So let's take x zero equals to x for for x and no. So we're making we're making no assum no assumptions on the set a, no 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 assumption on on the starting state. We're just fixing it to be something, right? And y zero we are making the assumption that is sampled from this distribution. Now we are interested in this quantity. What is the distribution of the chain after the coupling, right? After we can show that this holds, right? Remember, this is our assumption that, okay, that is that uh, here, right? Our assumption is that this type of inequality holds, right, for something, okay? This is a star here. Okay, so let's look at the distribution of the chain starting from X, right? And let's look at the probability that you start from X and then that you hit the set, A, right? So this is a, light, a slight abuse, abuse, abuse notation here. Remember that we use PTXY, for the probability that I start in X, take these steps and I line in Y. So now we have a set, it's the same, right? Now is the probability that I start in X, and then after these steps, I hit any of the of the states in A. Okay. So essentially, this is the probability that the chain belongs to A, given that X0 is X, but let me just remove the conditioning for make my life easier with the notation, but always think of that there is some conditioning here that X0 is, is X. Okay, so let's lower bound this event by the following, right? So clearly, if xt is equal to yt, that means at a time t they are equal, right? They, they have match, right? And yt is in A, right? If these two things happen, then clearly these things happen, right? Because they are equal, and then I know that yt is in A, then clearly xt is going to be in A. It's an inequality because xt may be e different from yt and it's still be in a, right? So you get it over bound, okay? So what is this? This is one, well, this is uh, the n of two events. So you look at the negation, You this is one minus the probability that xt not equals to yt or okay, the negation or uh, yt is not in a, right? And now I'm going to use something that is probably obvious to some of you, but if you are not taking a course on probability, it may uh, look a little weird, but essentially this is the idea of a union bound. So sounds familiar to some of you? 
I see some nodding, but that's uh, okay. But essentially, it says that if you have two events and you're looking at the probability that one or the other happens, this is always bounded by the probability of, by the sum of the probabilities. Okay. And here, you really don't need to assume anything. It always holds. I mean, it almost always holds. But they, in particular, the events A and B can be correlated in any way they like, and this will still hold. Okay. Okay, so we apply the union bound to this term here. So you get an upper bound that is this, this term here is going to be bound, upper bounded by the sum of the two probabilities. So you get the following lower bound, right? So you get one minus the probability that xt not equals to yt minus uh, the probability that yt is in it. So I think that there's a question in the chat regarding it should be yt not in a right because you negated the yes uh, thank you yeah that's correct okay so uh, and here too okay so now we have this right now one minus the probability that yt is not in a is essentially the probability that yt is in a. okay and now this term here, this we have an upper bound by assumption. This is the assumption of the theorem. The assumption of the theorem says that this is at most uh, one quarter. Okay. So you get that this is at least one quarter, right? So what we prove here is the probability that uh, <clears throat> that the probability that we start from x. And we land on a set A with no assumptions on this uh, on X or on A. We get that this is uh, uh, this is lower bounded by this. This might not be still one more step here. Remember that YT has distribution pi, right? YT is a distributed according to pi, right? So this is going to be equal to pi of R minus one quarter, right? So it's creating some separation. If you see, right? This is already getting some separation between the distribution of the chain. Right, and uh, it's bound in the separation between the distribution of the chain and the and the, the stationary distribution. Right, so you can rewrite this as something like one quarter greater than pi a um, minus d d f x a. Right, so now now this looks a lot like the total operation distance. Right, we're getting a bound on on this quantity, right, by one quarter. So what is left is to actually take care of uh, making sure that this implies, right? Now, what is left is to show that uh, is to show that, let's call this uh, star star. Uh, implies uh, that the TV, the total variation distance is uh, less, uh, less than one quarter, right? And now this is just uh, follows from the definition of the operation distance, right? So remember that we have this representation of the operation distance that is taking, that is saying, take the maximum over all the sets. And then you look at the difference, right? Of uh, let's say pi of a. Okay, and now you just do a little case by case analysis here to get rid of the absolute values, right? So that's what is missing here, we, we improve anything for the absolute values, right? But essentially, if, so you take, take A to be, let's say that, uh, or S set, uh, that maximizes uh, this one here, right? And if, then we also have that pi a is greater than greater or equal than, than this quantity, right? So that we can remove the absolute values. Then we know that this is bounded by one quarter, right? And we get that the operation this time is at most one quarter. Then we're done. Now, this is not necessarily the case, right? It could be that for this particular set, the opposite holds, right? That we have that ptxa is actually greater than pi of a. And what you do is that now you pick you, you choose instead the complement of A, right? Um, <clears throat> a complement, which is just all the other sets, right? 
So it's easy to see that they're going to have the same difference, right? Because the complement, right, is uh, the claim here is that pi of i minus, right? So if you, this is one, right? One minus pi of a complement minus one minus ptx of a complement, right? And the ones cancel, and then you end up with the same, right? The same difference. Right? Okay, so if A is the set that uh, maximizes, uh, it's a set that maximizes this, then A complement will have the same, uh, the same value for this difference here, for the absolute value of this difference, right? And in addition, since you're taking the complement now, it will satisfy this, right? Now the complement will satisfy this inequality and then you will be done. You get the same bound of one quarter. Okay, and that's it. That shows that that proves it, right? Because we bound, by the way, this is capital T. We've bound the total operation distance by one quarter at time T. So that's it. That's what we needed. The mixing time is, uh, the total operation is less than one quarter. So the mixing time is going to be bounded by T. Okay, questions? Yes, can you say again why, how you got from probability of YT in A to pi of A? Oh, here. Is this a step here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So remember that uh, that y zero was sampled from the stationary mesh. So we chose the initial distribution, the, the initial configuration of a the, of, of y. The way we chose that we took a sample from the stationary mesh, right? So y zero has distribution pi. And the definition of the stationary distribution is that if you take steps of the chain, right? If you that you you have some there is some random state initially, and then you take one step of the chain at time one, y1, right, is also going to have this distribution pi, right? And that holds for all t, actually. This is what this is saying here, that for all t greater or equal than zero, the distribution of the, of the chain y is going to be the same as the, as the stationary distribution pi, right? So that's why when we are here, the probability that yt, right, so this is yt, that belongs to A is the same as the probability of A on the pi because yt has distribution pi. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? And by the way, see how we really needed to use um, the fact that this inequality here holds for every x and y because once we draw a sample, from pi, we really don't know what the initial state is, right? But we don't care because this holds for every initial state. Okay, so this is another solo in the proof. Questions? Okay, so now let's uh, let's see the coupling method in action. So my my goal now now is going to be to show you an actual research result that uses the the coupling method. Right? So it's kind of an older result, 95. So I guess that classifies as old now, uh, but uh, it, it really is it's a simple. Now, I mean, now we can call it a simple application of the coupling method, okay? So let's go back to the, the proper colorings uh, macro chain, right? So this is one, one of the examples that I gave you of the macro chain. Okay. Back to proper colorings. It's also one chain that you guys uh, work on on your problem set. I asked you to do some stuff about it. I think this will be a good exercise for what we're going to do next, right? And remember now, what is the MC MC problem that we have here? So we're going to have some distribution by is going to be the uniform distribution over the set of all proper colorings, right? Of a graph, right? So it's a very natural algorithmic question. So I give you a graph, and I want a, not any uh, uh, proper coloring. I want a random one, right? I want, so the graph may have a thousand proper colorings. I want you to pick a random one for me, and that should be the output of your of your algorithm. Okay. And now, so the state space here, omega, would be the set of of all proper colors. Okay. So 
in the approach, we are going to design a macro chain. Well, we're going to take the same macro chain that we used in the example, the global dynamics, and we're going to use the coupling to, show, to bound the, the speed of convergence of the chain, right? But before trying to solve the problem, and this is probably a good practice, is we should say, okay, is, is the problem hard, right? Okay? And you already study, I think that most of you, if not all of you took your algorithms courses, right? And you show that uh, even deciding if a graph is uh, k colorable or q colorable, right? It's an MP complete problem, right? The decision version is uh, MP complete, right? Or MP hard. So, okay, so what are we trying to do here? We're trying to draw a sample from a set of objects that we cannot even find. That seems hard and it, it is hard in general, right? So we need to take uh, some assumptions, right? We're going to make some assumptions not on the, uh, on the relationship between the number of followers and the uh, highest degree of the graph, right? So usually when you prove hardness, you're going to do proof for that for some graph is hard. So the, generally, the problem in general is hard. So the way we're going to address the, the sampling problem is going to be, okay, let's focus on the regime where we know we can do it, right? That the graph is actually uh, k colorable, right? q colorable, colorable. And let's uh, let's solve the problem there because otherwise it's going to be hard, right? Just to give you an idea of what these re regimes look like, right? So here is a simple fact has been proved. I think this was proven in the late 90s. I mean, not, not all of it, but some of it was proven in the late 90s. Uh, so it says, suppose that, that it essentially caps to the fine grade complexity, right? So th this question here is too broad, right? It's saying, okay, the decision version is hard. That means that there's some graph, uh, that for some graph and some number of colors for which this problem is hard, right? Let's try to see a, a, a fine grain complexity result, right? Suppose that uh, <clears throat> max degree of, of G, is delta, right? So there are a few things that we can say. If Q is greater or equal than delta plus one, then the decision problem is easy, right? It's very easy, actually. You always can say yes to the decision problem. You can always do it, right? And actually, you can find the color quite easily with the greedy algorithm, right? I think this was one of the problems from yesterday. You put a color at a vertex, and you always have one color for the neighbor and, and you keep going, right? The condition tells you that you always have one color available to uh, complete the colony of the whole graph, okay? So this is easy, very easy actually. And it turns out that when Q is less than Delta, then the decision problem is NPR. Okay, okay. So there is this uh, threshold, right? That there is uh, the number of colors. When Q is less than Delta, it's hard. When Q is greater than Delta plus one, um, it's very easy actually. And there are some interesting things happen when Q is equal to Delta. But again, this, this case is completely fleshed out by, by Brooks theory. Okay? I'm not going to state it, but essentially uh, what this says is that if you have, have a half a click, a K delta click, right? Click on delta vertices, then it's, it's not recoverable. And if, if it doesn't have it, then it is. Right? So you can check this is the theorem from graph theory, and it tells you a condition for when the, the graph is uh, colorable or not. So it is either easy or hard, depending on where you can find this structure in the in the in the graph. Okay, all of this is for the decision problem. And so we're going to try this definitely solve the sampling problem in this easy regime, right? In the regime where they are coloring. So to sample colors, colorings, we're going to assume to assume that uh, Q is going to be at least delta plus one. And in fact, we'll take a slightly stronger assumption in a minute, but definitely we should only be thinking in this region, okay? Okay, so how are we going to sample colorings? We're going to use the, the this micro chain that I defined last time that is called the global dynamics, right? 
is the, is the, the, the one from the example. You pick a random vertex and then you pick a random color from the available ones, right? To sample, we're going to use uh, the, this is called the global dynamics, right? So let me just give you the name. I didn't give you the name before. Okay, so remember, so given a coloring, this is the same definition from last time, given this, which notation I'm using here, XT, given a coloring, XT. So first we pick a vertex uniformly at random, okay? Then we pick a color, random color uniformly at random from the set of available colors, right? So you are at a vertex B, the neighbors of B are going to have some colors, say red, blue, blue or something. So from the remaining colors, we pick a random one, right? So we do it from Q minus this, uh, the set of colors in the neighborhood of B. Okay, and then we set uh, the color of, of, uh, of B at time T plus one to we see, and then everything else is on change. Okay, so this is the, the macro shape from the example last that yes, right? And you can picture this in your head as you have your graph with some coloring, you pick a random vertex, and you try to flip that color to something else with some random operation. And you keep doing this and keep doing this. And the question that we want to, uh, to answer is how many steps do we need to perform this operation, right? How long, how many steps do we have to repeat this operation until we can guarantee the distribution of the chain is close to the stationary measure. And for that, we're going to use the, the coupling uh, the coupling layer, okay? So here is what we know about this chain, right? So there is this, uh, well, you, you showed this, I hope, in the um, <clears throat> the global dynamics. This is uh, the shorthanded GD, right? The global dynamics is ergodic when uh, <clears throat> Q is greater than the plus two, right? And, and converges to to our target distribution, right? Pi, right? That is the uniform over proper code. Okay, so it's uh, not trivial, right? Every time I, 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 I teach this, I have to go, go back and remind myself of the proof. But once you see the proof, it's uh, this idea of sorting the vertices and, and so So hopefully you guys uh, got it. Uh, but this is one of the chain that proving a Gaussian is not competitive yet. Sorry, what was delta? Oh, delta is the maximum degree. Right? Is uh, is delta, right? So delta is the maximum degree of the graph. So we need the number of colors needs to be at least the maximum degree of the graph plus two, right? So we only need maximum degree plus one for the decision problem to be easy. So there is this degree algorithm that works, but for sampling, Using the global dynamics, we are going to require that you have delta plus two code instead of delta plus one, right? And now there is this very long standing conjecture, right? That says that the global dynamics mixes, um, so let me just, uh, the mixing time of the global dynamics is order n log n when q is greater than the tablet. Okay? It's a very simple statement, a very simple mark of chain. This question has been open for 30 years and we don't have an answer for it. Okay, it's a conjecture. So I see that some of you are very unhappy about this and yes, so are we, yeah. We've been trying really hard and very smart people have thought about this for a long time and uh, we cannot prove it. The good thing is that we have made some progress and in the way, very interesting techniques for the analysis of micro chains have been developed that now are being used to analyze other modes, right? And other micro chains in other settings, okay? So it's really one of the, remember I told you at the beginning in the first lecture that uh, car shuffling one was one of the uh, important problems in the theory of, of, of Marco chains 
historically, right? What was developed there was quite relevant. The same thing goes for colorings. And uh, it's really, a, if you decide to do research on micro in the future, trying to understand the, the different techniques that were developed for colorings uh, year after year, let's say in the late 90s and early 2000s, is quite, uh, quite useful. Right? It's something that I always recommend my students to do. Okay? So let's see what we know, right? Before we prove something, let's see what we, know, what we know, or some of what we know. I won't be able to summarize this because the number of results is, is really great. Let me just give you some of the highlights, right? So the first uh, relevant result is due to Mark Jerome, 95. It shows that the mixing time is, uh, is actually n log n, but he needed to assume that you have many more colors than delta plus two, right? So the assumption here is that Q was uh, greater than uh, two delta plus one. Let me see. Yeah, two delta plus one, right? So this could be quite significant. For example, when delta, if delta depends on, on n, right, you're taking twice the number of colors. So this is quite different, right? So then there were some results in between, but then there is this uh, major result uh, from Bigoda 2000, right? Uh, so the mixing time, he shows that the mixing time is actually n square log n. So he provides a slightly worse uh, upper bound, but he really improved quite a bit on the, on the constant. So instead of two, he gets something like 11 or six uh, times that. Okay, so. So Mukta has a question, is this 2D plus one? Uh, I don't understand the question on Mukta, maybe you can clarify. By D you mean Delta? <laughs> Okay, feel free to follow up uh, with a question because I don't understand what, you, um, what you're asking. Delta is the maximum degree of the graph. And here we're regarding that the number of colors is greater than two times the maximum degree plus one. Okay, okay. so here is the other result from Bigoda. Jerome Sinclair is a coupling argument that I hope to show you how it is proved today. Actually, the, at least the highlights of how Jerome proved this. Um, Bigoda's result is also a goblin argument, but the, the goblin is, uh, you know, one of the most complex ones that you've seen, right? It's uh, no Markovian, and it just is, uh, it's really a, a great result. And this result has stood there for a long time as the best, right? So we have this conjecture. Is the conjecture true empirically? I think so. I think uh, many similar, I mean, the conjecture comes from simulating this many times and noting that the chain is, is fast. And this is an exercise that any can do, right? This is a very simple micro chain that you can go and code and see what it's behaving, right? And the congestion comes from both empirical and theoretical observations that this should be the right, uh, the right thing, okay? So this has stood as the best result for a long time. And in between, people prove stuff, right? People prove, so, okay, let's assume that the graph has, uh, has no short cycles. And then they were able to improve on the constant. And let's say all the assumptions, let's assume that this is a random graph, like an endos range random graph or a random regular graph. Can we sample colors there using the global dynamics? Yes, they can do it for a little bit uh, better uh, thresholds here. So in general, there was a lot of work done in between and some interesting even developed, but this was open for a, a worrying amount of time to the point that now maybe, people, okay, is the conjecture really provable? Right, can we prove it? Or this some, there is some kind of threshold that is there? And there is this uh, great result, I, I would think, that of uh, actually there were two results that got combined into one. This is uh, Shen, Michel Dercourt, and Moitra. There were two different teams, but they, they got combined into one result, I think. Uh, Lang. Also, this is uh, quite recent, I think 19. And this is, uh, this is kind of common, sort of common in TCS. Once you have this threshold there for a long time, people start questioning, like, can we improve anything? Like, can we go a little bit uh, further? And they do. They show uh, mixing time, again, order n squared log n, and then take Q, at least one, they improve by some very small constant, right? So epsilon zero here is something like 10 to the minus 10, right? So in practice, they have no, no difference, right? Like, uh, technically, like, this is irrelevant in practice. But theoretically, it's telling us something quite interesting, saying like, look, this, this threshold is artificial. We should be able to bypass this threshold with the right techniques, okay? 
And there are a couple of more recent results that, uh, so this is a team where I was part of, uh, blank, uh, so a bunch of autos, uh, Sunshine Chain is the last student. Uh, so this is Caputo. <clears throat> uh, so Daniel is another grad student. Uh, and then another Daniel, uh, Eric Bigo, uh, uh, another Daniel. So it's a large team. We were doing something completely different. We were actually analyzing micro chains for easing systems and so on. And we came up with this technique that actually gives some improvement to this, but it's very, very modest, right? Uh, just n log n. So we reduce the running time from n squared to n, and the same we need the same uh, condition on the on the on the relationship between maximum degree and and number of calls. Okay, and this was actually later. This is twenty one actually, and just uh, like a few weeks after we posted this, another grad student from uh, from University of Washington we proved the same result using a slightly different, very similar but slightly different ideas, and, and got the same the same type of results, okay? Okay, so grad students do uh, good work. So that's that's uh, that's good news for you, right? That's what we expect from grad, grad students when, when they're doing PhD, right? So, okay, so any questions about this? So this is the state, uh, I wanted to give you an idea of uh, the landscape here before we go and prove this result. Questions? Okay, so let's prove uh, Jerome's theorem, right? So it shows, so again, this is uh, 95, that if Q is greater or equal than two delta plus one, then T mix of the global dynamics is <clears throat> order n log. Okay, so the proof is going to use the coupling method. So we're going to design a coupling and then we're going to show that the two chains are getting close, the two, two copies of the chain are getting closer and closer to the right? So here is the, the coupling. So take, suppose XT and YT are the configurations after two steps. Okay, so we're not going to make any assumption on XT and YT or on T. So this is going to be a coupling that applies to any step, right? For any pair of steps, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we'll be able to do this. So we need some coordination. How are we going to achieve coordination between the two chains? Well, we're going to select the same vertex of both, right? Select the same <clears throat> uh, vertex P uniformly at random for both copies, right? And then now we need the color selection, right? So we're going to select um, two colors, CX and CY such that, okay, so we're going to impose two conditions here. I mean, this is what we're going, I'll show you how to do it, but this is what we want. CX is going to be uniformly at random from the set of available colors for B in X, right? It's going to be from Q, the set of colors not used by the neighbors of B. And then CY is going to be, again, selected uniformly at random from Q minus uh, YT. And Right? But in addition to that, we're going to select CX and CY such that the probability that the same is maximized, right? Such that the probability, I, the probability of CX equals CY is maximized. And this is where the, some coordinate, the coordination for selecting the color will come, right? So there's some coordination here, we're selecting the same vertex, and then there is going to be some coordination in selecting the color. But again, we need to preserve these two properties, right? Why is that? We need to preserve those two properties so that this coupling is valid. Okay? Right? 
is the coupling valid, right? So this is the question that is the coupling a valid coupling? Well, see what happens from the point of view of say X, right? A vertex is selected uniformly at random. X doesn't care that Y is going to use the same because from the point of view of X, the vertex was selected uniformly at random. And because of this, the color is also selected uniformly at random from the set that is supposed to be chosen. So from the point of view of X, everything is fine. X is evolving as, is, as it is supposed to evolve. From the point of view of Y, the same thing, the same thing holds, right? So it is a valid coupling. And the fact that they are going to coordinate so that this happens, it's going to be relevant for the, for the validity of the coupling, okay? So how can we maximize this, right? Okay? Let me give you some intuition here, right? With an example. <coughs> Let's assume that Q, kind of losing my voice in the last uh, stretch here, about 20 minutes ago. Let's take Q to be uh, one through seven, right? So we have seven colors, okay? And let's assume that, <clears throat> uh, let's say that the neighborhood of, of, uh, of B in X <clears throat> is only using two colors, right? Let's say it's using four and seven. And the neighborhood of uh, Y, <clears throat> the neighborhood of B on Y is using colors, uh, let's say five, six, and Okay, so this is a common situation that you could encounter. Q is seven, and this uh, in one neighborhood, two colors are being used. In the other neighborhood, three colors are being used, okay? So this means that the set CX, right, is the set of all available colors for, for B in X, right? So it's one, two, three, five, and six, right? And then CY is the set of colors not being used here, so you get, And the way you coordinate this is by noting that it's as follows, right? So suppose that this is the interval zero one, right? And to select a color from the point of view of CX, but X dos is, is going to pick a random number between zero and one. And if the random number is less than 0 0.2, just put this threshold here, right? Which is completely off scale, but we we'll just fix it. Right? So what, uh, what can X, uh, what, what, what X does to sample the color is say, look, if the random number is between zero and 0 0.2, I'm going to assign a color one. So this is from the point of view of X. If it is within 0.2 or 0.4, I'm going to assign a color two, otherwise color three, color four, color five, Something doesn't look right here. Yes, I messed this up. So it should be 0 0.6 here, 0 0.8, and 1. Okay? <coughs> now, clearly, if we follow the sampling pattern, we are sampling a uniform color from CX, okay? By the way, this is uh, keep making typos, and this is making you... So it's 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6, okay? <clears throat> so if the random number is here, we put, put one. If the random number is here, we pick two. Here we pick three and so on, okay? So this would be good for X. And what about for Y? For Y, we're going to use the same random number. We cannot do something like this because the probability here are different, right? Each color here, we have probability a little bit longer, larger, 0 0.25, not 0 0.2. So what we'll do is we split the interval differently, right? But again, if we are between zero and 0 0.2, we're going to assign color one. And if we are between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4, we're going to assign color two between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6, color three, right? This is not quite enough, right? This is only giving 0.2 probability, but it should be 0.25. Okay, we'll fix that later, right? 
So now let's say that an hour you can do this in different ways. This is two one. Between 0 0.6 and 0 0.085, right? We assign four. And then we split this in intervals of size 0 0.05, right? So this will be 0 0.9 and 0 0.95. And here we put again color one. Here we put again color two, and here we put color three, right? <coughs> so if the random number is within 0 and 0 0.2, both chains are going to get one, right? If it is within 0 0.2 and 0 0.4, both chains pick color two here both chains pick color three now if it's above 0. 0.6 okay now they're not going to agree right because if it is in this interval this one is going to pick five but if in that interval this one may be pick four or one or two and three but the point is that both uh, sampling schemes are valid right this one is a, sam a valid sampling scheme for cx this one is a valid sampling scheme for cy okay and there is a lot of agreement right if r is between 0 and 0. 0.6 they are going to agree on the color so that's what you do, essentially. That's how you maximize the probability of agreement, right? Let's generalize this with a uh, little lemma now, right? <clears throat> so let U be a finite set, and A and B subsets of, of, of U. Suppose that uh, CA is uniform distribution over A and CV is a uniform over B. Then there exists a joint uh, distribution such that the probability that CA equals CV is going to be equal to the size of the intersection or the maximum size A and B, right? And if you look at this theorem, that's exactly what I did here, right? I kind of follow the proof of this theorem for this example. You see, the size of the intersection is three because you have three colors in common and this, the largest size of the two set is five, so you get three feet, right? And, we, and that's the cycle we prove. We put 0. 0. 0.6, which is uh, 3 feet. Okay, that they agree with probability 0. 0.6, right? And the proof is I actually put this as an exercise in your problem set, just do this, right? Generalize this example to, to the general case, right? Okay? Generalize idea from example, okay? Okay, so that's essentially all we need. Right now we have all the tools, we have the coupling design, we have this theorem that tells us the probability that uh, they're going to agree. So now let's see, let's actually prove what we need to do about the coupling, right? And we're going to use something that sometimes is called like a fresh moment method to do it. So you'll see it's just, uh, fairly straightforward, right? So we're going to introduce uh, some notation here. Uh, so we're going to take AT, to be, so this is a subset of vertices. So this is the set of vertices where they have the same color in XT and YT, right? So where XT and YT agree. And now DG is going to be the set of this agreement, right? It's going to be the, the set of vertices where they have different colors in, in, in. So this is actually equal to B minus AT, right? So all the vertices, <coughs> and our goal is going to be to show that this uh, set, actually the set of this element is actually shrinking over time. And it's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking after so many steps, we're going to show that the set of these elements is zero. When the set of this element is empty or has size zero, then well, they agree everywhere, right? So we're going to show that the expected uh, size of the of the set of these elements at time t plus one, say given the configurations at time x t and y t, is always going to be shrinking. So we're going to, to be able to prove something like this. Right? So c here is going to be some constant. Okay. So once we have this. 
Okay, if we were able to prove this, right? Let's just see how you how we we use this to finish up the proof, right? So what you do is you take expectations now again. So and this gives you this recurrence, taking expectation here and using the tower property, right? So you get that this is uh, less than one minus c over n times uh, expected value of pg. So it gives you a recurrence, right? Between the expectation of t at time t plus one and the expectation of t. So you will now repeat this again, right? If you repeat it one more step, you get something like. <coughs> okay. And now you keep going, right? You keep repeating this. And then you get this, right? Okay? So now this, the number of disagreements, even at the beginning, if you got really unlucky, this at most can be n, right? This is at most n. So you get that this is less than n times one minus cn to the t. And if you take t to be something like uh, quite large, like uh, you take it, uh, okay, maybe it's easier if I do one more inequality here, right? So this is less than e to the, just using that one minus x is less than e to the minus x. So you get that uh, this is, minus cn times t, right? So if you take t to be like uh, something like n to the c log of uh, 4n or something, right? I'm plugging in this inequality. You see that for sufficiently large t of order n log n, right? The t that is order n log n, you get that this uh, expected value of dt plus one, right? Is less than one quarter. Okay, and from this, now you use Markov inequality. This is another standard inequality that says that the probability that X greater or equal than A is less than the expectation of X for A, right? So use that inequality because now you can, you see, you can bound the probability that XT, this is what we're after, right? Bounding the, the coupling, uh, the coupling probability. The probability that XT is not equal to YT, right? Uh, this is bounded by the probability that dt is greater or equal than one, right? You, you know, the, so if there is uh, if there is at least one disagreement, you know that they're going to be different, right? So this event uh, implies this, uh, let's see, this one implies this one, so this one has higher probability, right? Okay? This one implies this one, so this one has higher probability, okay? So now use Markov inequality here, so you get the expectation of dt over one, right? And now well, we know that the expectation is less than one quarter. So overall, you get that the probability of disagreement less than one quarter and you're done, okay? Now, this is how to use this to show the mixing time. The real trick in, in, in Mark's uh, proof, Mark Yellen's proof, is to actually prove this. And there is kind of a combinatorial argument to this. I, I think that with the time remaining, I will only be able to give you the, the highlights of this uh, combinatorial argument, but it's something that I, I'm sure that most of you can follow because as I say, now it's a matter of uh, uh, checking local conditions for the number of available colors and so on, try right? some, some uh, easy combinatorics, right? If combinatorics are ever easy, okay? But let's see. So how, how can you proceed to show something like that, right? So we want to bound this expectation, right? Given xt and yt. And the observation here is that this disagreement cannot really change by much in one step, right? The disagreement will either stay the same but since you're only flipping one vertex, the disagreement will either go up by one or down by one, right? So just using the expectation here, so this is going to be dt, right? The disagreement at nt plus one with some probability, let's call it p1, is going to stay the same, right? There's going to be no change with some other probability, let's call it p2, and may, it may decrease, right? It may decrease uh, with some probability, right? And this term here, because we are interested in see how this contract, this term here is not going to be too relevant, right? So this is the term, it's more, mostly relevant. It says, what is the probability that there is no change? We, we really don't care if there is no change. What we are more interested in is in bound this, this probability, P1 and P2, right? So let's see how much of the proof of, of one of them can I give, right? So let's, uh, let me at least give you the highlights of how you prove one of them, right? Maybe we cannot go through all the steps, but let's go through some of the steps. Right? How to bound 
let's say P1, like uh, P1, right? So P1 is the probability that TT plus one is equal to TT plus one. So the observation here is that in order for the disagreements to increase, you need to pick something that agrees and turn it into a disagreement, right? If you have something that they disagree, okay, if, you, if it cannot increase the number of disagreements because that vertex is already a disagreement. So you need to select a vertex in the set of agreements, and then you need to select a color to a pair of colors CX and CYs that are different for both of them, right? So essentially you can write this probability P1 as uh, the summation over all the vertices in AT, the, pro the probability that you select that vertex, every vertex is selected with probably one over N, so you get one over N, and then you get the probability that CX, the random colors, right? CX not equal to CY, given that B select, right? And now you insist into this some notation here, but essentially what you're going to use, do is, uh, and this is where I'm going to start with the uh, coding corners here. So we use this lemma, the lemma that I use, uh, this lemma here, right? This lemma is giving you an expression for this probability of, of, uh, of equality, right? So what we do is use lemma. So this is uh, the shortcuts that are coming in here to show <coughs> that uh, that this probability is small, right? I won't give you the precise bound to show that, uh, let's see, that the probability that CX not equals to CY uh, is bounded from above by, I guess, mm, it's, uh, okay, so you get some some quantity here, M, let's not define it for now, or Q minus two, right? So essentially, uh, okay, let's just ignore this for a moment. You get some upper bound on this, and then you take the sum that the upper bound is going to be independent of B. So you get an over, 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 uh, upper bound on this probability P1. So the details are in my notes. You can follow the notes there. Um, as I said, you just set some notation and then use the lemma and you get this upper bound, right? So you're going to get some over bound for P1. You're going to get some over bound for, for P3. This you know you won't need because you're, you're focusing on, on how this change, right? So on, on P2, you can just drop that one. So these are on, the only two relevant ones. And uh, and that's it. That, that once you get combine these upper bounds, you, you prove that this is uh, less than one minus C over N. And the constant C here, this is perhaps important, right? The constant C here is going to have a closed form. It's going to be something like Q minus two delta or Q minus delta, right? And this is what you need the assumption that Q is going to be at least two delta plus one, right? Because otherwise this constant here will be negative. And if this constant is negative, it means that there is no contraction. Actually, you'll be showing something that is useless, right? It's saying that it's not, well, no, you're not completely useless, but useless for proving the fast mixing result. Okay? Okay, so I wanted to stop, and, and this is it, right? So this is it for the coupling method. I have planned to, to also cover a little bit of the of the other important method for uh, for analyzing micro chains convergence, which involves the spectral gap. So I think that one of you asked this question: like, uh, is the is linear algebra useful for the analysis of micro chain? The answer is yes; it's very useful. So one thing that you can do is you you consider the transition matrix P. You look at the set of eigenvalues. You can show that the eigenvalues are actually less than one. Actually, between one, between one and minus one, right? All the eigenvalues are going to be one and minus one. And if you look at the first and second eigenvalue, the first one is going to be one always, because this is the one that corresponds to a stationary measure, right? You have pi times p equals uh, pi. So one is, is an eigenvalue for, for pi. If you look at the second one, which is lambda two, which is unique, it is going to be less than one when there is a unique stationary measure. This difference, one minus lambda two, also give you a bound on the mixing time. And just so that you see the kind of theorems that we can prove there, right? Is that the mixing time is bounded by, <clears throat> let's say order one minus lambda two, and then this is the second, second largest second value times some quantity. So this is a log over one over pi mean, this is something that depends only on the distribution, right? Pi mean is the mean X in omega, of pi over, okay, right? And the good thing 
from this method, one good thing from this method that you don't get from the public method is that it gives you also a lower bound, right? You also get that this is at least, uh, let's say, omega of, Okay, and there's some advantages to this method, right? So you may argue that computing eigenvalues is easier than trying to come up with a clever coupling. Right? There is really no clever thing here, right? In a sense, just well, there is, but you could argue that okay, I just need to compute this eigenvalue. I put this in my lab, give me my eigenvalues, and I have a bound on the mixing time. The point is that these are exponential size metrics, right? So there is no hope of you plugging this into my lab. And my lab output in the, the exact value of the eigenvalue. So the design and the clever things that people do with, the, with this approach is to come up with methods that allow you to bound the eigenvalues with are actually, actually computing them because you can't compute them in most cases. In fact, there are very, very few cases where we can actually compute them exactly, right? So there are a bunch of techniques that have been developed to bound this, uh, this spectrum, okay? So I want to stop here. And now I, I hope I was hoping to give you more time for this, but <clears throat> I like to answer questions and not, not only questions about the material here, right? Questions about Markov chains in general, research on Markov chains, like how you get started on research on Markov chains. Is it worth it? Right? Is it a good uh, career choice for you when you go to grad school to learn about Markov chains? Where does this community lie within TCS or math right, or physics? Or any other questions that you'd like to ask me, maybe we can spend five, 10 minutes and if my voice allowed, I will answer all the, the questions that, that you have. <coughs> so I will uh, ask the TAs to give you the links to a couple of textbooks. books. Essentially there is a book by, <coughs> Mark it on, but it's a very good introduction to counting and sampling. And it has a, a, few, a few short chapters on, on, the, on the coupling method and coloring, which is pretty similar to what we did today. And there is uh, another book. It's more uh, math uh, oriented and it's more, it's more oriented to the math uh, on the grad student, but it's quite useful, right? And it's very compre comprehensive to, on all the techniques for analyzing my question, right? So I will send these two resources to you. I think they are quite uh, good books in the sense that you kind of start from almost zero and start reading them and, and, and learn about more about this stuff. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, maybe you go ahead. <laughs> so there is a question in the chat. Once you guys decide the ordering on the questions, so let me answer that one. Is how how did you get into studying Marco Chain? It's it's quite surprising, right? That uh, my whole research career was uh, almost random in a sense because what happened was I was an undergrad at Georgia Tech. I was doing these uh, programming competitions, ICBC and so on. And then the coach uh, was a grad student and said, look, why don't you research, right? At the time I had no uh, idea of going to grad school or anything. I was just doing that for fun. So I approached the one math class that I had taken at the time. It was a, a class on linear algebra. And the faculty actually turns out to be someone doing micro change. So they gave me a problem. So I was thinking about it. I really liked the subject. And for the rest of my undergrad, I did uh, research on, on micro change, right? Then I got into grad school. It turns out that there was one faculty in the, in, in, in the, in the grad school that I went that was doing research on micro change and was one of the uh, most famous research is on micro chain. So it seemed very natural to me to continue doing what I, what I like. So my whole research career was based on this uh, completely arbitrary choice when I was an undergrad. But what this says is that it's, it's very hard to go wrong if you lo like, like uh, the, the TCS, topics in TCS. If I had approached another faculty, maybe I'd be doing algorithmic game theory or cryptography or something else, right? And I think it would have been fine. I would have enjoyed it. And I think uh, things would have been more or less uh, the same, right? So it's just a matter that you need to pick a topic that you like. And I mean, this worked for me. Some, some of my colleagues actually went to grad school and they had no idea of what they wanted to do. And they tried uh, one thing and then try another and then try another. And you know, the third one worked for them, right? One of my closest colleagues I started, uh, he entered, 
grad school thinking that he wanted to do computational biology, ended up doing quantum computing. Okay, so very, very different thing. <coughs> Any other questions? Hi, uh, I have a question. So thanks for the great lectures. Yeah, so I have a question about, can you elaborate a little bit more on comparing the spectral methods and the traditional combinatorial methods? Especially is there any examples like uh, one can prove better bond than the other, or like in general, these two methods are incomparable or there are some known limitations to any of them? Okay, so <clears throat> for the method of, uh, there are two big splits on the analyzing of convergence of microchain. There are probabilistic methods, like the coupling method, and the analytical methods, like uh, the one that we did, uh, functional analytical methods, like that means fancy work from linear algebra, in a sense. Okay, so <clears throat> coupling methods are, I think, generally better, right? Like if you can prove a good coupling, right, you also usually get better bounds on the microchain. So if your goal is to really analyze the microchain precisely, right, coupling methods tends to be better, right? But the coupling method has this design aspect to it, right? So you know, there are many, there is an infinite number of coupling and you're guaranteed that there is a good one. How do you find it? Right? And it's up to you to find it. You have to be clever on your choice, right? Sometimes it's not possible, right? And sometimes even you design a coupling, you simulate it in the computer and you see that it's quite fast, but you cannot prove it, right? You, we don't have, we have very few tools to actually prove coupling, right? And that's where this other approach of linear algebra comes into play. Usually the bounds here are weaker. So this approach don't tend to give tight bound on the mixing time. They tend to give hopper bounds. It's very common to see like polynomial mixing time or n to the 10 mixing time using this type of bounds. Sometimes it's n to the four. And one reason, not the only one, but one reason is that you pay this penalty here always when you're getting the bound. Remember that pi min has support on an exponential size set. So this could be a large polynomial, right? So at least you know that you're going to be a large polynomial off from the right quantity, even if you bound, right? Now, there are some better methods, more analytic method, analytical methods that you can replace this log here by a log log, and then you don't look at the spectral gap, but you look at more advanced constants like the log solar constant or the modified log solar constant. But these are quantities that are even harder to compute, right? So, so what is the, the answer? What, when, should, when should you use one method or the other? And my answer to you is, you know, try everything, right? That's usually the way it goes, right? Uh, you, you try, you know, to try to bound the gap, you try the coupling, you try different things until uh, you find something that works, right? If, if you're lucky, right? Um, and by the way, I think that this answers the question, this is also a, it's a problem, but there are techniques, but there are not that many techniques for bounding the speed of convergence of the microchain. And in my own research, I've been to this, I've been analyzing this microchain. And after a while, I've seen like, well, I've tried everything and nothing works. What can I do? Like there is no, there's no more techniques to try. Right. And you know, sometimes you need to move on and say, that's it. I cannot do it. I come back with that once I, I know more and there are more techniques. Eh? Every now and then a techniques, a new technique comes up. Like recently in this in this paper that uh, that I mentioned here for, for colorings, uh, this one here, we actually developed some new technique and now that has consequences for many microchains that in the past I have tried to analyze and I couldn't, right? And now we can with this new method, okay? Yeah, but uh, that's the, the landscape of the techniques more or less. There's another question on the chat. Right, so there are all versions of the microchain. So um, there, there are, right? So the, the point is that <clears throat> if you look at, so let's say, K steps of the microchain to make your choice, you also have a microchain on a different state of space, right? Now the state of space is going to be the set of uh, K, you know, state of space to the K, right? It's the uh, state of space times the dynamic the state. So you look at this plot of space, of k, uh, uh, of dimension k, right? And your transition matrix is now, depending on the configuration on k states to define the next one, right? 
So the answer is yes. You, and I've seen people try to do this. Like uh, I know that in computational biology, they look at these macro chains that look at more than one uh, uh, gene in a, in a nucleotide in a DNA sequence, right? But now the, the state of space is more complex. They're usually harder to analyze. So there is some trade-off, right? And this is a natural trade-off, right? The more your model looks like reality, the harder it is to analyze theoretically, right? Okay, any other questions? Uh, I had a question about the conjecture, this like delta plus one. So if someone proves this, does it have connections to other areas or would the results be confined to just like this particular model? Well, like sometimes in TCS, people find a hard problem and they say like, oh, if you could solve this problem, this would imply X about some other problem. Right. I don't think that there are such results, right? I, I think uh, that, that, okay, so there are two, wishful kind of uh, results here, right? Like uh, one is how you prove it, right? At the moment we think that to prove this, you will, need, you will require new ideas, right? You require some new insights, some, some new techniques, and these techniques may allow you to analyze all chains in other modes, right? For the particular case of colorings, I believe that the global dynamics is the best algorithm that we have for sampling. Like all methods for sampling are not as good as the global dynamics, right? So, for areas where you need to sample colors, and I know that in a statistical physics, for example, they need to sample proper colorings quite fast, and they use the global dynamics because they don't care that we don't have proof, right? They, they just use it. But I think it would be very informative to, to them to know that what they're doing is a sound algorithm that it's, it's outputting things without bias and stuff. But who knows, right? Maybe the proof is very specific, right? And only applies to this problem. Uh, we'll have to see how the proof looks like, right? So Mariam has a question where something from uniform, no uniform, it's any different. I can tell you that something from the uniform distribution is, is sharply high in general. So it doesn't get any harder than that. So uh, in some cases, then non-uniform distribution sometimes makes things easier or harder. It really depends on, on, the, on the thing. Sometimes people will say weights to make your life easier because you can reweight the configurations and, and it makes your life easier. But there are some distributions that are not uniform for which we know that it's also sharply hard to, to sample. So there is really no difference uh, between them. Both of them can be hard or easy. Any other questions? <clears throat> Well, I hope you enjoy this this uh, this course. Uh, I'm sure you'll see more of MCMC, regardless of the area that you decide to go. Uh, MCMC are, are now uh, very well established, and um, even if you don't need to analyze it theoretically, you may still need to use uh, some of the results that are now. Okay? And by the way, uh, maybe I can I make my email available if you have follow up questions. I'm happy to to answer them. Oh, I can do it in a Slack, actually. I, I doubt that the Slack channel will close. So just post your questions there and uh, answer there. Okay, see you guys.